This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Hewitt podcast available every morning on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen. It's Friday the 3rd of May in London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, Conservative losses mount as Labour makes significant gains in England's local elections. Apple announces the largest share repurchase in US history as the tech giant predicts a return to growth. Plus a Goldman offer to high performers. The Wall Street giant is scrapping the EU-era bonus cap for hundreds of British staff. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. Labour has scored a number of early victories in local elections in England and Wales as the Conservatives look on track for heavy losses. The opposition party also won the Blackpool South by-election with a massive 26% swing. New Labour MP Chris Webb says his landslide is a sign that voters want change. They've had enough for 14 years of the Conservatives being in power. They have lost trust of the British people and Blackpool has had enough of this failed government which has crashed the economy, destroyed our public services and put up taxes. Webb's success is the first major setback in an expected slew of defeats for Rishi Sunak's Tory party. The Conservatives have lost control of three local councils so far. Pollsters expect that they could lose as many as 500 seats. The Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, says that's because... The Conservatives are defending seats won at an electoral high point back in 2021. We had a vaccine bounce. We just come out of a global pandemic and we got the benefit from the public in that set of local elections. Uh, and that was a very high base. And most of these seats were contested at that time. So, you know, it is going to make the evening difficult, I think. Harper and other Conservative MPs are likely to be watching mayoral election results expected later today and into the weekend. If the West Midlands mayor, Conservative Andy Street, loses, many would see it as a moment of danger for the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Shares in Apple have jumped in late trading. The company posted stronger than expected sales, predicted a return to growth and announced the biggest buyback in US history. Apple's board approved a $110 billion repurchase of stock, while the firm also raised its quarterly dividend for the 12th year in a row. Here's our chief correspondent, Mark Gurman, on Apple's performance in China. The biggest highlight was Apple did quite a bit better in China uh, than CounterPoint Research, IDC and others had anticipated. They had said that iPhone sales in China had declined by 19%. Tim Cook was asked to try to square that away on the earnings call. But the truth is, how could he, right? These are third-party analyst reports making one claim. Apple has the actual numbers. Mark Herman referring there to CEO Tim Cook telling investors on the earnings call that iPhone revenue in mainland China grew on a reported basis. It's though that that the discrepancy with CounterPoint and IDC may arise from differences in the way and that the analysis and Apple account for revenue. Now to bank earnings. Credit Agricole reported first quarter profits that beat estimates of 1.9 billion euros, 400 million above estimates. The gains were driven by strength in its international retail bank and corporate and investment bank divisions. The French lender also has pulled forward a target to reach uh, adjusted profits of 6 billion euros a year ahead of schedule. Meanwhile, Société Générale has seen profits uh, beat estimates in the first quarter as equities traders outshot on their bond trading counterparts for a fourth quarter in a row. Income from the trading of equities products rose 3% to €870 million, although that equity performance was still behind Wall Street peers, who posted an average 6% increase in revenue. China's Huawei Technologies was put on the US trade blacklist nearly five years ago, but Bloomberg has learned that the company has been secretly funding cutting-edge research at American universities. Huawei is doing so as the sole funder of an awards programme run by the DC-based Optica Foundation. Bloomberg Technology and National Security reporter Kate O'Keefe broke the story. Huawei is on so many different US government lists. Probably the most significant um, are these Commerce Department restrictions that prevent people and entities from sharing technology with the company. But in terms of um, academic research or you know, research that's meant to be published, those rules don't apply. O'Keefe says applicants and university officials told her they didn't know about Huawei's role in their awards until a reporter ta- asked about it. Huawei says it created the competition along with Opticus to support global research. The Chinese company added it kept its name private so the contest wouldn't be seen as promotional. 
Bank of England efforts to stimulate the economy during the pandemic caused 115 million a billion pounds in losses on quantitative easing. According to Bloomberg analysis, the central bank is on track to lose at least £120 billion uh, pounds on bonds bought during the COVID period. UK taxpayers will have to cover the cost under a guarantee that was agreed with the Bank of England when the programme launched in 2009. It's estimated that taxpayers will cover the losses of about £20 billion pounds per year for the next decade. Goldman Sachs is set to scrap its pre-Brexit cap on bankers' bonuses, but the move has sparked employee concerns that fixed pay will be docked as a result. Bloomberg's Tiwa Adebayo has the details. Top traders and investment bankers at Goldman Sachs will now have the opportunity to earn many times their base salaries. That's as the bank prepares to ditch EU-era limits on bonuses after the UK government lifted local pay restrictions for the sector six months ago. Bloomberg understands that the news was announced internally this week, but some employees fear their regular pay may be cut to compensate. Goldman Sachs is one of the first banks to lift its UK cap since the government's rule change. In London, Tiwa Adebayo, Bloomberg Radio. Well, let's get more now on those results of the local elections overnight in the UK, showing Keir Starmer's Labour Party has made important gains in the first council seats to be declared in England. Labour have also won the by-election in Blackpool. Chris Webb will be the new MP there. Joining us to discuss the results is YouGov's Director of Political Analysis, Patrick English. Patrick, great to have you with us this morning. The by-election, first of all. Keir Starmer calls it seismic. Chris Webb says the Prime Minister should now call a general election. How important a swing to Labour was this? Good morning. Yes, well, it was the third largest swing from the Conservatives to the Labour Party in post-war British electoral history. So this was indeed seismic and really quite a, uh, a stark reminder of just how bad really public opinion is for the Conservative Party right now and how low their support is uh, right across the country. Our latest polling has them down at 18% of expressed vote intention and the result that we saw in Blackpool South was very much in line with that sort of level of nationwide support. So I think it's a reminder, It's it serves as another piece of, of evidence to suggest that the polling, where it is right now, is probably a very accurate, a pretty good reflection of, of the of relative popularity of the parties and it's suggests that Labour are on course to have quite a uh, a seismic election result themselves as and when that comes around, if nothing changes in between now and when that election is called. Mm. What do the local elections show in terms of the council seats? Because obviously Blackpool South is for a seat in Westminster for an MP. The local elections are very uh, fought on different issues sometimes or not? Yes, absolutely, they are. Local, is- uh, local issues, local candidates, local stories. For example, down in Plymouth has been a, a huge swing against the Conservatives and toward Labour, uh, much outsized to what uh, what we've been seeing around the rest of the country. And that's down to the fact that the Conservative Council chopped down a load of trees in the dead of the night and then the leader had to resign the day after. So lo- local issues do drive results. However, we can appeal to the general patterns of trends and the general movements of parties uh, across all the seats being contested. The BBC will be putting out its projected national share later as well, which allows us to see if all areas of the voters of countries, uh, country had voted, how that might have broken down. And it gives us a better comparison of, uh, we can then compare year on year on year and see what kind of momentum the parties have going into the elections. And I think looking at some interesting areas as well to see how the parties are performing vis-a-vis the sort of key battleground areas when it comes to uh, constituencies. So up in North East Lincolnshire, Labour managed to take that council out of Conservative hands and into no overall control. Well, that contains both the constituencies of Scunthorpe and the new Grinsby and Cleethorpe constituency to, let's say, the classic red wall constituencies that Labour has to be winning back at a general election to get a shot at majority. They have done very well in the council election there. And we're going to be looking, I think, to other areas such as Walsall to see if they can repeat that story over in the Midlands. Dudley as well could be very interesting. Hindburn, another one that we've got our eyes on. Uh, Lots of very fascinating races up and down the country, which you can't read directly across from council elections to general election, but they can give you very strong indicators, the relative strength of the parties, who has momentum and who doesn't. What about the the other parties in this as well, the Lib Dems, the Greens and Reform UK, whose performance was talked about a lot in advance of this? 
Yes, well, in fact, some of the, 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 the most striking or strongest individual performances the, the night have come from the Green Party. They've, they've come from, in some cases, third or fourth to sweep through all opposition and take council seats. We've been seeing them winning places like Peterborough, down in Exeter, uh, up in the north as well. They've been doing very well. In Newcastle, they've got uh, so, some councillors there too. So they have been putting on a very good show and what seems to be a very good night for the Green Party. Reform started the night as probably the largest story. They, they had some very, very strong performances up in Sunderland and again Walsall is going to be interesting to see there because again another council which is quite heavily leave voting they're standing a good slate of candidates there which you we can't really say of many other local authorities that haven't really organized all that well for these elections so reforms certainly have been pulling up some trees where they've been fielding candidates and uh, the Liberal Democrats they haven't had a fantastic time of it so far I think they'll probably be a little bit disappointed with where the figures are right now however as has been pointed out by a few of their politicians who've been on the airwaves overnight their strongest areas are probably coming a little bit further down the line. Uh, councils more toward the south where they are fighting co directly with the Conservatives rather than with Labour. So we'll see how they do as those seats start to declare a little later mm. on in the count today and uh, uh, into tomorrow as well. OK, um, Patrick, how do you think about then these local council elections in the na national picture? I mean, how bad is it for the Conservatives? Will the Tories, for example, dump Rishi Sunak before a national election? That has also been um, you know, posited. And the the idea of when the, the, the general election in the UK might come. I mean, those those national questions now, what's your answer? Well, I think certainly the, as I said uh, at the top of the, this piece, the Local authority elections result we are seeing now, and indeed the Blackpool South by election, would seem to suggest that the polling is correct about where the parties are right now. So that would suggest that Labour are well ahead. It would suggest that the Conservatives are struggling. It would suggest that Reform UK are a threat to the Conservatives and are eating into their vote and causing them problems. And as regards to what the Conservative Party are going to do about that, I think it's 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 it's, it's unlikely that they will change leader. I think that will probably be seen as a bit too much political chaos if ever there was such a thing uh, and they will probably be looking to just try and get the economy stabilized try and go long as they say push the election date as far back as they can to in the hope that people see perhaps those flights taking off for Rwanda hopefully they start to feel the benefits of a, a lower inflation rate more money in their pockets to be able to pay the bills that are coming through their doors but these are all ifs and buts and maybes right now the public are quite clear on Rishi Sunak and they're quite clear on the Conservatives and the government and the message that they're delivering throughout these results, throughout these opinion polls, is that they want it changed and they want them gone. OK, Patrick English, Director of Political Analytics at YouGov. Thank you so much for your analysis on the programme this morning. Now to the earnings story. Out of Apple, of course, yesterday, shares in Apple jumped in after hours trading. The company reported stronger than expected sales last quarter, despite revenue falling by 4%. The iPhone maker also announced this significant stock buyback, biggest in US history, worth $110 billion. Matt Bloxham is back with us from Bloomberg Intelligence to take us through those earnings. Um, what was the particular bright spot then for, for Apple, do you think? Yeah, so I think um, on the revenue side, it's absolutely the, the China performance. Now, China is about 18% of their sales, and they did shrink about 8% down, but the market was looking for about an 11% decline. And I think the overall commentary from the company um, about their positioning in China was surprisingly positive. And I think you know, the analysts asked a lot of questions about China on the call and didn't really quite kind of process what they were hearing from Tim Cook. But he, he was saying, you know, if you adjusted for um, some exceptionals last year, that you know, they kind of grew ch iPhone revenue um, in the quarter in China. Obviously, there'd been a lot of channel checks uh, suggesting that they'd been under a lot of pressure with the iPhone in that market. And he said that in urban China, the um, two of their models that, that iPhone 15 models were the top selling um, phones. So, you know, I think that was a real bright spot. And I think they were quite optimistic about the near and midterm outlook. I think on top of that, um, Mac sales were particularly strong because they had a product refresh there. And I think that gives people encouragement that next quarter, basically next week, they're going to announce a new iPad lineup. iPad revenues were down about 17% in the quarter this reported, but they're expecting a strong rebound next quarter. And I think the fact that Mac sales were up on a good product refresh gives people confidence that they'll rebound too. 
Um, that, of course, being Apple rewarding its shareholders for mm. the, that kind of positive set of uh, results, the massive share buyback, $110 billion. How significant is that? Well, if you put this in the context of Apple's market cap, it's about 4%. Um, so, you know, you'd kind of expect that kind of return from uh, uh, from many companies anyway. And their dividend is only about half a percent. So, you know, kind of 4.5% total return. Uh, they're in an incredibly, you know, strong net cash position over time. They want to get to a kind of net neutral position on the balance sheet. So I think it's consistent um, with their overall kind of distribution policy. Um, and, you know, to, to a degree, kind of reflects, you know, obviously, by buying back stock, you get a bit of earnings growth because you reduce the share count. And given that top line growth, even if they return to growth next quarter, um, yeah, earnings growth is going to be relatively muted from the kind of fundamentals. So that buyback gives a lift to the bottom line. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 11.30. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.